Welcome everybody. We're so excited to have you. If you guys caught any of that uh, last bit of the conversation, that was just a private Q&A that we held beforehand, but don't worry, you didn't miss out on anything. The, the main conversation starts right now. Um, and we'll be going over uh, some questions that have been submitted and questions that you guys might have um, throughout this conversation. Um, but let's go ahead and, and get started here for our main conversation about the peaceful coexistence with wildlife. Um, again, if you guys have any, uh, or excuse me, if you guys want to register for any of our future events, make sure you go to mercurynews.com slash events eastbaytimes.com slash events or marinij.com slash events. Um, you can also uh, not only register, but you can find past uh, events that we've done and look at the recordings of those. Um, but yeah, let's go ahead and get started, not waste any time. I'm going to go ahead and introduce you our uh, garden and animal writer, Joan Morris. Joan, thank you so much uh, and take the main conversation away. Thanks, Sarah, and, and welcome to everyone who's tuning in now to um, to listen to how to get along with wildlife and um, you stay safe and sane and they stay safe. Um, our guest panelists today are two uh, folks very experienced in dealing with wildlife, hands-on, <laughs> which not all of us has a chance to do, but um, let me introduce to you um, Nicole Wager, I have trouble with that name, from the Peninsula Humane Society and SPCA, and Emma Molinaire from Lindsay Wildlife Experience. And uh, we'll start with Emma. Um, why don't you introduce yourself and tell us a little bit about yourself? Hi, everybody. My name is Emma, and I'm the curator of Animal Encounters at Lindsay Wildlife Experience. And if you're not familiar with our nature center, we are located in Walnut Creek, where we have a rehabilitation hospital that's been operating since 1970, as well as um, an exhibit space where people can come and see animals and learn about wildlife. The animals that live at Lindsay cannot return to the wild most often because of a negative um, impact with people. And it is their job and my job to help talk to people about how we can peacefully coexist with wildlife. And I'm very, very excited to do so today. Thanks, Emma. And Nicole, um, I know you've got a lot of experience in some of these more unusual rescues that uh, Peninsula Humane Society has done. But why don't you give us a little bit about your background? Uh, well, I'm a registered veterinary technician, so I kind of started off in the dogs and cats and uh, regular animals and then moved over into wildlife. Um, I manage our wildlife rehabilitation center. So basically what we do is we take care of orphans, sick and injured wildlife exclusively. Um, and right now we have about 300 patients in our hospital <laughs> that we are taking uh, care of hands on right now. So yeah, this is our busy season and um, we're getting in lots and lots of patients. Well, they're lucky to have you guys, both of you. Um, earlier this month, we talked about gardening with wildlife and we focused mostly on how to exclude them from our yards and gardens. and um, or to just put up with some of the damage that they might do. And so today we're gonna to talk more about um, all the wildlife that we share our space with and how to um, peacefully coexist. That's the name of the webinar. Um, I'd like to talk first before we get into the reader questions a little bit about why it's important that um, we get along with wildlife, you know, a lot of people say, hey, it's my yard, it's my garden, I spend all this money on my lawn, I, it's my property, why should I let wildlife roam through it? And there are dangers to the wildlife for this, but anyway, um, maybe Emma, you can start and talk some about why we need to get along with wildlife. Yeah, that's why we need to get along with wildlife. Well, the reality is wildlife is here with us. We are in, you know, and they were here first, frankly. We have moved into their space, especially here in the Bay Area. I hear 
Um, you know, I receive questions often about animals coming into people's yards. And when they tell me where they live, they say, oh, I'm right backed up next to Mount Diablo. I'm right back, backed up to this open space. Some people are in the middle of the suburbs too, but if you zoom out, from where that suburban environment has been created, it's plopped right into the middle of where animals have lived for hundreds and hundreds of years. So we're moving into their space and the animals are trying to adjust accordingly. So yeah, it can be fresh. It's, it's my house. I work really hard. I buy, I, you know, I, I take care of this space and then I have this raccoon that comes in and messes everything up. Well, that they feel very frustrating and feel like, oh, I'm against nature and we're at odds. But there is a way to, like we're talking about today, peacefully live with them and coexist to make sure that the animals are getting what they need in order to be successful in participating and keeping our ecosystem healthy and functioning um, versus constantly feeling like we're at odds. And the reason we want to have animals around is it's a trickle effect from, you know, a tiny little insect is food for a small hummingbird and her babies who then might be prey for another larger uh, animal, a larger carnivore, who then therefore might be prey for a higher up one. And by removing any of those links, we can see falls in wildlife populations. And then, which if you don't like animals, you're like, well, I don't care. I'd be happy with absolutely no animals at all. It'd be great if it were just people in my garden. But the reality is we could not keep healthy soils. We could not have, you know, healthy, how plants are naturally distributed is not going to be moving across as well if we eliminate all of the wildlife. So the best way to keep our ecosystem in our backyard healthy is by learning how to work with the challenges that we have. And there are many ways that we can uh, work to live peacefully with animals. Nicole, um, kind of the flip side of that, what's the risk? to uh, wildlife from people that say, hey, I want wildlife in my backyard, so much to the point that they're feeding, hand feeding in some cases, and allowing the animals to, to live under their decks. And That ends up being a really big problem for the animals. To, um, and most of the time, uh, most of the cases we hear about animals coming into conflict with people has to do with a situation like that. The neighbor's been feeding the raccoons. The neighbor's been feeding the coyotes. The coyotes have been in the, in the news a lot lately. And for the most part, coyotes are very benign. They're keeping down your rodent population. They're wonderful. But if we start feeding them, they get used to us. And then somebody gets bit. Somebody gets scared. Um, the animal gets killed. Or somebody ends up you know, at the hospital getting a bite. So. And it's usually not the person who is feeding the animal. So you have to really have respect for all of your neighbors too, in that you're gonna cause a problem for the animal and then you're gonna cause a problem for some other human. So um, it's really best to let those animals just be wild. Let them be part of the ecosystem. Let them be eating your rodents. Let them be eating your bugs um, and don't feed them. I always say it never ends well for the wild animal. Exactly. Okay, so let's uh, get into some questions. Um, I have one from Harry who says, um, we have a drip system for irrigation where there's an adjustable cylinder type tip that can be adjusted. We put in the plantings last June. Since then, I've had to replace more than 120 tips when the rats chewed them off. I assume looking for water. Any suggestions to reduce or eliminate the damage and the missing water tip? Anybody got ideas on that, Nicole? No, I don't have, I don't know if my idea is any good. The only thing I would think is to put some sort of a hardware cloth or something over it so they're not chewing at it. Um, again, they're coming looking for food, water, shelter, and that you're providing water, you're providing a needed resource. Um, so unless you can cover it somehow, they're probably going to come back for it. Emma? Yeah, and um, yeah, I would kind of go off on that. We talked in an earlier uh, conversation about um, spicy things. So you can attempt to put maybe some, you sprinkle some cayenne pepper you can get in bulk on the internet there are there's also many things that uh humans make that are bitter um that you can try to put on there to see if that's um gonna keep the animal away 
realistically though, if it's a rat trying to achieve a goal, the rat is going to achieve the goal it sets out to do. Rats are very, very clever. So when I'm doing a little bit of research, it's not my area of expertise, but on drip line irrigation, I do see that there are ways that you can, um, you can actually submer put it under uh, the ground. Now, if you put it too deep under the ground, you could run into issues with burrowing animals, chewing them straight through, but that could be something that you can try. Maybe there is a way that you can sandwich um, your drip irrigation system. So by putting um, more of like a, oh goodness, I'm forgetting what the turns off, but basically like a metal grate over the top. It's sometimes put on top of lawns that you're able to mow over. I'm going to look up the terms. It is falling off my, out of my head. So if Joan or Nicole, you know what it is, jump in and save me. But you could try putting your irrigation system potentially under one of those, making it more difficult for a rat to go under and remove the tips. But one of the things I want to encourage for you, if this is something that you just cannot avoid it by adding, oh, um, another th thought I had for this is by adding a motion sensored lights. Um, again, rats really like to be under that darkness so they can avoid predators more easily. So by illuminating the spaces, the reason of course we water at night is that we don't want the water to get evaporated by the heat of the sun. So by doing it during daylight hours, that might not be the best, but if we're able to push the light on um, that could help as well. And overall, I encourage you to think about what you're doing. Why are you doing a drip irrigation system? Well, it's more efficient for your garden and ultimately better for the environment. And when you're looking at, you know, what I'm doing overall with the practices that I have going into nature, that might be unfortunately a consequence that you are going to have because you're trying to be more sustainable. And it can be really frustrating when you're trying to do the right thing and trying to do what's best for the environment and then something else in the environment's kind of messing it up. But I, when, I, when I read that, I thought, you know what, I think it's really great that you're still doing it. I think it's really great that you're trying to find a solution and not just going, well, forget it. I'm gonna use a watering technique that's inefficient and wasteful. So I'm, I think you should be encouraged that you are helping the environment, even though it is really annoying that these rats and cost of, costly that the rats are stealing these parts. Um, overall, the impact that you're giving to the environment is, is good. And I think you should be encouraged by what you're doing and what you're attempting to do. I'm a big fan of if you uh, can't beat them, join them. And I don't quite fit, but... <laughs> Uh, if they're after the water that's in the irrigation lines, you could set out some water far away from the area that you want to protect. And uh, rats and squirrels also gnaw, have to gnaw on things to keep the size of their teeth in check. So if they're chewing on um, the irrigation or the fittings, for that reason, you can set out some kindling, some uh, animal bones. If, um, if you cook ribs, you can you know, put the rib bones out or you can get antlers, uh, put out salt licks, things like that that will distract them and move them away. And along those, um, that area, there, we have a question from Jane who says, is it okay to put water out for whoever comes around? Uh, she puts out two small cottage cheese containers with water and sees the water's gone almost daily. Um, also, her sprinklers are recycled water, and she wonders if the water is okay for the birds and animals. So, Nicole, do you have any thoughts on, on that? Um, I would say it, it, putting out water is not a, a, in and of itself a bad thing, but you do need to have, be thinking about how much water, who you're attracting, um, maybe keeping that water at the back of your property so you're not encouraging rats and other things to get close to your house. Um, and for me, a lot of that ends up being like bird feeder, bird baths and things. And whenever you're putting something out to help, it comes with responsibilities. It comes with the responsibility of cleaning it, replacing the water. So um, I encourage people to think about all those things before they do that. Um, I think putting out some water in the back of your, your property would be okay, but please don't put out food with it, basically. Yeah, I know we're moving into summer and a lot of people um, feel badly especially during a drought, go badly for the wildlife and they want to put out water. And I just, I always like to remind people that, yeah, you might attract the, you know, sweet little deer, 
drinks the water, so cute. But you're also attracting the mountain lion that feeds on the cute little deer. So there are- well, That's actually a really good thing because people like to attract things like deer to their yards. And then they're upset that the mountain lion has followed, but it's, that's, that's dinner. They're attracting- that's nature. They're again putting food out. <laughs> <laughs> and I think I emphasize what Nicole just said, by putting out water, you are putting out food. You're putting out the food that the animal, the animals that are coming. You're putting out food for the prey item. So, yeah, that's it is. If you have a drip irrigation system and they're driving you nuts, a, a solution for incompatible behavior would be okay. I put water over here. They can't chew this. You can definitely try it, but like Joan and Nicole are saying, pay attention to what the consequences are for you for that. Are you noticing an increase in raccoons? Are you noticing an increase in opossums, deer, and attracting other predators? Maybe you decide you only want to keep the water out during the problematic times of the day. When are these animals chewing on them? Are you noticing that they're gone only at night or are they gone during the day? So by limiting what you offer, that could kind of balance uh, everything that you're working with. But yeah, watering animals definitely could come with some of these unintended consequences that later you might come back and be like, well, what the heck's going on back here? And then it's because you're setting your backyard up to be an Eden, which can be wonderful, but also cause some problems. Yeah. Um, Harry also asked, or said he installed a new lawn this summer and for about two months had a family of marauding raccoons, my favorite image, marauding raccoons. Um, they had a professional who trapped at least 13 animals. That's incredible. We then put out a fine net mesh, um, over, I'm assuming over the top of the lawn and applied grub killer. And we were doing well, but the raccoons have again appeared, no lawn damage yet. But they seem to think our roof and yard are party and orgy heaven, woohoo. Any suggestions on uh, dealing with the raccoon? Well, the, the nematodes and the, the killing of the grubs is really the best way to deal with that. But the thing they have to remember is you have to, you have to reapply. It has to be done multiple times a year. It's not a apply, done, I'm over, they've left. You have to keep doing it. And I would suggest they do it fairly quickly if the raccoons have come, have come back. But from everybody I've told this and they've tried it, it has worked really, really well. So just remember repeated doses. Yeah, and those are called beneficial nematodes and you can buy them a lot more places now than you could before. And uh, they're near microscopic little creatures. You water them into your lawn at dusk. They go into the soil and seek out the grubs and do terrible things to them, but we don't care because the grubs, <laughs> I'm sorry. And, um, but yeah, they, they don't last forever. Yeah, that, that is absolutely, I love those types of solutions because you're using biology um, to get to your goal. You know, you're in introducing things that are naturally occurring in the ecosystem to help manage these. And those are a really, really cool solution. And like, it's just, it's just interesting that you're going out and bringing that into the environment because why we're talking about these nematodes um, is a lot of times the raccoons are coming, they're coming to dig up the grubs. You also can have some uh, instances with skunks for that as well. What you can also do is for digging up your yard, I know you said like a fine mesh that you use for your trees um, for covering the ground. That's an option too, though a raccoon may be able to tear through that depending on what you use. You can also put welded wire down close to the ground. It's a little more tough. You can mow over it and it does make it even more difficult for the raccoons to bring it up. But yeah, my suggestion is exactly what Nicole said. Get yourself some nematodes. <laughs> It's not often we have a simple solution that works really well. So, yeah. <laughs> so when we do, we're excited about it. <laughs> um, Michael has written here that there's a skunk that hangs out or has made its home in our hedges. Unfortunately, unfortunately the outside faucet and main water shut off is behind the hedges, and I have to reach over them to attach the hose every time I water. What's a good way to coexist without running into skunky? Uh, it stuck its head tail out and I hurriedly backed off when I reached over the edges. I was thinking of spraying an irritant in the area. So uh, what are some good ideas about dealing with the skunk? 
So skunks, and like this person um, saw, skunks usually warn you. They, they don't really want to, to spray you. So they'll give you a good warning. Um, one of the, the ways that you can get him to at least move to a different house, maybe in your yard, maybe somewhere else, is um, motion-activated floodlights work really well. So you could position one right back there where your water is. So every time he's back there, the light would flash him and it will be uncomfortable and they will move on. The other thing you can do is kind of trim yourself more space between your house, your faucet and that bush. Um, and, but it's really great that you are hoping to live nicely with this raccoon, with this uh, skunk. Skunky, love skunky. So as funny as it sounds, uh, that light absolutely would work. Um, again, I said to the earlier group, you can also try playing a radio or some Bluetooth thing to make human noises, drum sound, really whatever you want that doesn't sound natural, something they wouldn't hear in nature, could be uncomfortable for an animal that really does like to be left alone and tends to be pretty shy and not confrontational if they can avoid it. Um, so the lights, the sounds, and it might sound silly because we're talking about a stinky skunk, but you can also try um, some scent to encourage the animal to go away. Um, ammonia dri um, dipped cotton balls in that area for a prolonged period of time. Um, you might have to try it for a couple of days because the skunk might be like, all right, maybe this will go away after one day. But if you keep these deterrent methods up, eventually the animal will realize there has to be a better bush to sleep under and we'll move on. And I find that especially true of skunks. It doesn't take a lot. They really just want to be left alone. They want quiet. They want dark. So noise, lights, and they, they usually move on. And the big thing is, and we're talking about this across the board, it's consistency. What we want to do with the animals that were there, it's how animals learn. And we as a human animal learn is when I do X, why happens. So if we expect to go out there and do something once, it would have to be an incredible aversive. It would have to be something so out of the world that that skunk has ever seen it and never wants to go back there. But that's not going to be effective for you for the next skunk. And then the skunk after that, or then maybe the raccoon the third time. So we want to be continual with what we're doing with these mitigation efforts um, in order to be successful in the long run. Um, I have a question here from Jody. Um, ask about JT Eaton bait block with, and I'm not going to be able to pronounce the uh, divastinin in bait blocks around the condo property. Is it harmful to wildlife, especially hawks or owls that might eat rats that have eaten the bait? Is it harmful to cats and dogs? And is it effective in reducing the rat population? So do, do y'all know about this product? I looked into it a little bit. Um, <clears throat> we have with this product here, it's, well, it's a poison. So yes, it is dangerous. It is, it is dangerous if your animal eats it, your child eats it, you eat it. Um, it is dangerous. It is designed to kill animals. So when you're talking about something with a larger body, I mean, body mass, you know, it might not necessarily kill a full grown person, though I am not going to not take that as an endorsement. It is not, it would cause a lot of damage. So when this poison, when I looked into it, it can take uh, multiple days for the animals to die, which is during that period. So let's just talk about even what this poison is for the first place. This is an anticoagulating, um, it affects like the clotting in the animal's body. So the animal will ingest the poison smaller, um, rodents may die within a day or so not immediately they don't it's not like in a cartoon where they drink the poison and immediately fall over uh what happens is inside their body their blood vessels will slowly start to leak and you're getting internal bleeding so it is a very it's not a gentle way to go and during that period the animals are leaking blood into their own body, which is graphic, but I want to, everyone to be clear as to what these poisons are doing. And they're living for a couple of days, something I was reading about this poison, up to two to five days. During that time, the animal is getting sicker and sicker, and it's starting to behave potentially erratically and moving slowly and walking up on the surface, maybe during times of the day that it wouldn't normally, or even times of the day it would. And predators have evolved over millions of years to target the old, the young, and the sick and the weak. So when they see an animal struggling on the surface, they are excited about that opportunity. That's an easy prey item. I can expend as little energy as possible and gain a whole bunch of energy back. And what happens is we have secondary poisonings. And at Lindsay Wildlife Experience, 
in 2020, we had 10 animals that were brought in, predator, um, predators and some prey animals that were brought in, anything from a couple of great horned owls, western screech owls, barn owls, to um, gophers, what we had some wood rats, so some intended targets, squirrels as well, and of and we uh, had a raccoon, and we had one poison case this year, and of all of the 11 animals that were brought into our rehabilitation hospital, they all died. So what happens in that case, and those are the animals that are brought in. The predators will go and get that prey item that is easy for them to get, and their biology is telling them that they can handle and take. They can break down any, you know, maybe diseases that are in that prey item. They take it and they eat it or they bring it back to their babies. And what you're doing is you're taking out a predator. Like I mentioned in an earlier point in the conversation, a family of barn owls can eat a thousand mice in a year. So if you take out a barn owl family, you are taking out a potential exterminator of a thousand mice, something that the poison is just simply, it's very unlikely to get. And as far as the efficacy, well, it definitely is effective at killing animals. So absolutely will kill animals, but it doesn't solve the root of the problem. What you hear Nicole talk about a lot and what I'm completely supporting and echoing is what has changed in the environment? Have you removed things that are homes for these animals to live in? Have you moved the water sources? Are you picking your fruit from the tree while they're ripe instead of letting ripe fruit sit on the tree or fall to the ground and attracting these animals? If none of those other elements have changed, the poison's not gonna be effective. New animals are going to move in. Rats can reproduce at as early as five weeks. So you're talking about an animal that's reproducing at an incredibly high rate um, because they're eating at an incredibly high rate and just they're going to keep coming in and keep consuming those poisons. So in, as a rule of thumb at Lindsay, and I'm sure Nicole have uh, let her talk about from her organization, we do not recommend poisons at all. They're cruel for the animals they are targeted for and they do cause um, other animals like the predators to die as well. Yeah, and another thing that people don't always realize is some of the predators that do eat it don't die. And then they have problems with their immune system, they get mange, they have all other, they can't fight off other diseases. So it, it's, it really does have a huge blooming effect. So yeah, I, I don't recommend it at all. In studies, yeah. it goes all the way up to mountain lions too. Yeah, that's, we've lost several mountain lions because of that. And it's, it can be an accumulative effect. They don't eat one poison rat, but if they eat 12, you know, that have been poisoned. And each thing isn't actually immediately killing them. It's just knocking them down a notch and a notch and their immune system is just going down and down and down. And then they're just very vulnerable. Yeah. Uh, Jim Stoner asks, what critters building a large ground nest of twigs? The nests are two feet by three feet and 18 inches high, often against a fence or tree. I'm in Los Altos and have had four of these nests over the years. Could it be rabbits or rats? Some it could, kind be, of like it could be wood rats. They build these big stick nests that can be varying sizes, but they can get very big. Um, the thing to remember with that, if they're seeing a wood rat, is it's not the same as those house rats that you're getting and that we've been talking about all this time. These are plant eaters. <laughs> These are, are animals that will never come and nest in your house. Um, so they're very benign, um, but that would be a possibility for that. That was my first thought. Yeah, I, I, I'm going to vote. I'm going to vote for that as well. <laughs> And are wood rats also called pack rats? Is that maybe a more familiar term? Yeah. Um, <clears throat> we have a question that asks, what do we do when birds hit our windows? The one that hit my window was dazed for several minutes. I heard another bird looked really bad after a window crash. I know that um, windows, birds flying into windows cause uh, a huge number of deaths of birds every year. A lot of those are in big cities with high rises, but even our own um, houses, you know, you can have birds fly in. Um, do you have some suggestions for making those windows more um, visible? 
believe it or not, having them be a bit dirty helps a bit. <laughs> Yay! <laughs> <laughs> Don't keep your windows perfectly spotless. Yeah. Uh, this is something I personally do. I just don't wash my windows. Um, it helps. It really, really helps. There's also decals. Um, there are actually special glass you can have put in your windows that are visible to the birds so they won't just crash into it. That said, if you do have a bird crash into your window, if it is not very quickly up and flown off, um, we do recommend you bring it to a rehabber um, so they could help them. We have anti-inflammatory drugs that can help them to recover from that. Absolutely, and if you think about it from a bird's perspective, like why are these little dummies flying into these windows? Well, I think we all can admit in the chat if we, I'm going to raise my hand here. I have walked into a glass window and wall before. And I think if we're all being honest with ourselves, we all have done it. And as a species, we've invented glass. So birds, on the other hand, they didn't invent glass. And much of the time, it looks like they can either fly directly through your house if you have one, if you have two windows opposing on the side of the room, or more often, it reflects the skyline. So the bird's eyes are just different than human eyes. The way that they see and perceive the world is different than ours. So that's the reason why we're flying into the glass. So Nicole's suggestion as to keeping it a little bit dirty, putting on those decals. Um, some people will put like ropes in front of them or even lowering your blinds during certain times of the day if you have a really reflective element um, will work well. At um, Lindsay, we typically recommend that if a bird is not up and moving around again after 30 minutes, that to bring it into a licensed rehabilitator. Um, for last year, I'm looking at my notes here, we got 2020, we got 185 window strike cases this year so far as of yesterday, um, we had 85. And after the first 24 hours, this, our success rate to return those animals back to the wild is around, um, last year was 62.9% and this year is 70.7%. Um, but um, the initial collision of the animals who do not survive the first 24 hours, their success rate at our facility is only around 30%, 30 to 40%. So by preventing these window strikes from happening in the first place, you're going to have a much higher um, likelihood of having a more peaceful and healthy ecosystem in your back. But sometimes it does happen, even if you have dirty glass, even if you have these mitigation efforts. And in those cases, it's monitoring the burden if it hasn't flown away within 30 minutes, giving a rehabilitator a call. Now, sometimes you might have a Cooper's hawk that is chasing a bird and the bird flies into the window to try to escape. This might be a good place to talk about uh, what people should do if they find uh, injured wildlife and maybe something about how that they need to make sure the, the animal really needs to be rescued. But sometimes it doesn't. Nicole, I think you mentioned you actually at this time of year with all these babies out there, a lot of the babies we get in are they did not need to be rescued. They were basically kidnapped. Um, but so we really encourage people if they see something that they think needs to be rescued, give us a call first. Um, let us help you to help it stay with its parents. Um, especially right now, we see a lot of fledgling baby birds that really they're just learning to be baby birds and no, they don't fly like their parents do, but their parents are there and their parents are taking care of them. Um, so basically we really recommend if you see that, give us a call, we'll help you to figure out whether that baby needs to come in. Um, the same thing goes for baby, you know, baby raccoons. Um, and most of those animals, again, are either they think they're kidnapped or they don't want them in their yard, <laughs> um, which we get a lot too. But we really, really, really would like to keep all these babies with their parents. I've been getting a few questions from my readers about um, ducklings and they think they've been abandoned. Is it normal or is it common for the parents to maybe leave the ducklings alone for several hours or maybe even a, a day or two? Um, I don't think it's, it's normal. Mallard moms usually stay with their babies, but unfortunately, if they get scared off from their ducklings, um, they don't always come back and they really don't come back if there's anybody around. So basically we, people are trying to help the mama duck because they don't think she has any water um, and they scare her and she flies off and then you really do have orphaned babies. Um, so 
I recommend not helping mom too much, um, giving her lots of space, letting her, she knows where she wants to take him, let her go with them. We may not agree it was a good idea, but she knows what she needs to do and to let her do it. And actually I have a really perfect story that happened in my neighborhood. I got a ring on my doorbell saying, there's a duck in, I'm here. And I, and I'm like, oh, okay. So I go outside my door and there was a terrified mother duck and all of her ducklings and every single neighbor out and surrounding them. And luckily for them, they have a resident person who works at Lindsay Wildlife Experience there to help out. And what they were doing is exactly what Nicole was describing. What uh, the, it was probably my guess, it was a first year, maybe second year duck who she was having her babies for the first time and wandered into our neighborhood, which kind of cul de sac itself. So she was not where she needed to be. And what people were trying to do to help her was actually scaring her and driving her into the corner of the house. Now, fortunately for the babies, this mom was a real fighter. She had her tail open, she was hissing, and she was like really trying to come at us. So in that situation, what I asked my neighbors to do is ask everybody to take a step back because we, the ducks don't see us as Snow White. The animals don't see us <laughs> as we're there to help them in any circumstance. It doesn't matter if you, are like if you're outside and you have butterflies land on you if you are great with your animals at home when you're out in nature in the wild you are the scariest thing the animal has ever seen and especially when you start coming up close so the first thing in that situation i got everyone to back up i used a towel as a shield not for me the risk of me getting injured by a, a duck is incredibly low but what it did is it created a barrier so she didn't see me and I was easily able to guide her out of the neighborhood once the humans got out of the way once the humans were out of the way mom was able to see where she could go she took all of her babies with her and we weren't in a situation where we accidentally triggered a mom to fly off because we think about it from a biological perspective she doesn't want to die so if she flies away she'll go and she's I'll make more babies so we want to make sure that we're not pushing her into a situation where she has to make a really difficult choice. Um, Christopher uh, wrote, we have possums and raccoons that pass through our back patio at night along a fence that's kind of a wildlife highway, which we enjoy. We want to learn more about them. Where do possums and raccoons in residential neighborhoods live in the daytime? Raccoons will sleep in trees. They'll do that too, um, under your porches. I'll, I'll let Nicole do more too. Um, they, basically in all the places that Nicole and I are telling you, you gotta get rid of in your yard. They go under your porch, they go under your shrubs, they go under your wood piles, they go maybe even behind your compost bin. That's that's where they're hanging out um, during the daytime. And then they come out at night because um, they tend to be sleeping during the day and they come out at night and take those fence line highways uh, over your yard. But Nicole, I thought you had something to pass it off to you. No, I was basically going to say the same thing, but I love that they're enjoying watching it. They're not, they're not getting the animals into trouble. They're not feeding them. They're not doing anything wrong, but enjoying the wildlife that we have around us. So um, kudos, good job. <laughs> uh, just scrolling through the questions here. Um, this, this isn't necessarily wild, well, it's kind of wildlife, but um, I get this question a lot on how to discourage feral cats. I don't mind them killing rodents, but don't want cat pee on my patio furniture. I don't know, it kind of sounds like an even uh, trade there, but uh, do you guys have any ideas about feral cats and uh, how to keep them out of your yard? Go ahead, I really have a lot of feral cat experience. I like to keep them out of my yard because I like I have a lot of songbirds in my yard and I don't like them eating the songbirds. Um, but I would think that some of the things that work with um, wildlife might work with feral cats too in terms of you know floodlights that are uh, motion activated. Um, I don't know that noise will really work with cats, but I am sure some sense probably would work with cats too. Emma, do you have any other good suggestions? 
Yeah, uh, well, first things first, um, make sure you're not feeding them on purpose. So um, that is a big thing. Cats are incredibly, incredibly damaging to wildlife, which is um, one of the reasons that we are, we always say as rehabilitators or wildlife educators, we're saying, do not let your cat outside. Uh, my cat who does go outside, he goes on a harness and he goes with me on a leash and he gets to explore nature safely that way. Um, otherwise, when he is inside, um, he has other things that he, we engage him with toys, enrichment activities to keep him excited and interested indoors. So because cats don't need to go outdoors. We just need to make sure we're providing an enriching habit inside. Yeah, Nicole. I was just going to add, if you're a cat lover, if you don't even care about wildlife, keep your cat indoors. Indoor cats live vastly longer than outdoor cats. So yes, they can be happy. They can live long lives. And it's, it's better for the cats themselves. Absolutely. And another solution for the cats, you know, um, you know, if you're not feeding them or you can't discourage your neighbor from feeding them, there is a motion activated sprinkler. And I'm going to link it below. There is a, it is powerful. I saw, I have not personally used it, but doing some research, uh, I found it and man, it gives this raccoon in a video, a really good spray. This is a non-lethal uh, deterrent. Of course, it is a little bit more of a stronger adversive. So it isn't something I'm going to initially, and I have it initially recommended um, just because, you know, you get it you get an animal wet in that could, it's, they're not going to be turned into a gremlin or anything like that, but you know, you could trigger hypothermia um, if the animal's not doing very well. Uh, but, and again, it's a little bit more aggressive than I would like to go. But if you have um, feral cats who might not be dissuaded from any of the other um, techniques, a little bit of water is not going to kill a cat or a lot of bit of water, but it will be triggered when it is motion censored. It's going to blast at that cat, making your yard seem like a place that they don't want to be. They don't want to be ambushed with surprise um, bolts of water. So I'm going to, again, I have not used it, so I'm not incredibly endorsing it. Please do your own research first before selecting any of the products that we recommend. I know Nicole and I both do not work for any of these companies. So, um, but I will uh, drop that link in the chat here just in case somebody finds that helpful, but it wouldn't be my first choice. There are certain odors that cats don't like, but it's not a universal. You can't find one that works for all of them. Uh, peppermint oil could be useful. Um, if they're digging in your beds, um, using a mulch that is rough, they don't like sticky, you know, pointed things on their feet. Um, I also recommend the method I like to call the uh, fork U method which is you go to Sam's or Costco and you buy the biggest box of plastic forks that you can find and you plant them in your beds with the tines up and you do them almost to the level of the soil and then they won't walk on that. And usually cats, um, you know, if it's not an easy in and out of your yard, they won't come back. Um, Gary Bogue, my predecessor, always recommended planting a pot of catnip, putting it in the far corner of your yard. Cats come in, they go crazy for it, and then they forget why they're in your yard and they wander off into the neighbor's yard. So he says. Um, I have a question about what is digging these big deep holes approximately six to 12 inches wide underneath our large rocks at night? No mounds of dirt, but lots of scattered dirt dug up. Also appears to be another smaller hole nearby. Some, sometimes entire new small plants are eaten also in our newly planted front yard. I'm going to guess uh, maybe ground squirrels. What do you guys think? Could be ground squirrels. Could also be um, like a raccoon looking for some grub or food source that's underneath there. Um, they can dig that that deep. And since the holes are bigger, I would think it might be something bigger um, digging. Uh, the ground squirrels would probably be tunneling more than leaving just small little holes. Um, but I would guess a food source. Yeah, identifying what animal lives in a hole is actually pretty hard um, based on the hole. We do, I, I know I get this question a lot. I'm sure Nicole gets this question a lot too. And that's because like 
the style of hole varies based on what the animal's intending to do with it, just like Nicole said. So for example, you have gophers, they have two kinds of hole styles, right? They're gonna have the ones where they're tunneling down really low and they're actually like creating their home under the ground. And that's more wide and expansive and a little bit deeper. Then they're gonna have other holes, which are the mound ones we typically see and that are very obvious to us, where it seems like overnight because it is. They'll ba ba build these really big mounds that are relatively shallow on the surface as well. And that's just one animal. And that's only about this big or so. And then you go with, I mean, yeah, it could be a ground squirrel. It could be a gopher. It could be a vole. It could be a snake moved into the hole that someone left behind. And on their way out, they blasted a bigger hole. It's really, really hard to tell. Um, so in, in my, I, I'm going to say, yeah, they're probably going to, if they say they're digging up your plants, it's, the best if you want to know what it is, um, you can put on um, some night motion activated camera. If you're just curious, like what is going on out there? Um, Nest cams, the brand Nest. Um, I know uh, people will use a lot to help identify what they have going on in their backyard, but the same rules apply um, for what we're talking about. Animals that are digging around in your yard. And that's kind of the good thing. When we're talking about problematic mammals, a lot of these tricks work across the board. Eliminate where they're hiding put something that's stinky and smelly there so they don't want to come back, put something that tastes bad, put some shine light, play music. A lot of these solutions you're going to hear Nicole and I say over and over again because they are effective. So that's kind of a long answer to a short question for me to say, I don't know. <laughs> Just scrolling through this list of uh, questions, it seems like the vast majority of them are asking about what to do about gophers and rats. Um, I know we talked before about the rats and um, trying to make your yard as um, unfriendly as possible, removing hiding places, nesting places, food and water. Um, the thing about rats is they're commensal, they live with humans. Even if you got rid of all the ones in your yard, there's plenty more that will come back. So, um, but let's let's talk about the gophers. Uh, they do a lot of damage in um, lawns and in gardens. Is there any reliable way that you know of other than trapping and killing? Um, I again love the hardware cloth. It works really well. You, you don't want to get the thin like um, chicken wire because they'll just chew right through that. You want to get really the thicker um, hardware cloth, but it works and it works for a number of years. Yeah, when you've got them in your lawn though, what, what do you do? Well, you can use it in your lawn um, in a couple of ways. There's a product that goes over the top and the lawn kind of grows up through it. Um, but then also if you're putting in a lawn, if you think of it ahead of time, is you can lay that hardware cloth below and then put the lawn on top and then that works really well. And then using some of the techniques that we said before, right? So if you have animals in the hole, I we said it in the earlier chat, but you can attempt to put, um, I think I saw, um, I saw a mothball suggestion again in the chat over here. Yeah, stinky things, use stinky things. Um, folklore has it that, um, human urine in a hole could potentially be an aversive. I'm not recommending that, but I thought it was fun when I did my research on it. But really urine does, uh, can be affected. You can buy um, urine online, as funny not, as that sounds, um, for animal deterrence. And what you're gonna wanna put out for those is you're gonna wanna put rodent, um, you're not gonna necessarily wanna use deer urine. A gopher is not really gonna care that a deer is nearby. You're gonna wanna use something like a coyote or a fox, something that is a predator. Uh, if you have cats at home, you can put some of the used litter potentially in some of the holes. And again, be consistent so that the gopher doesn't think, oh, maybe it was just a cat passing by, um, that it was an unattractive area. Um, if you do have a high population of rodents that live under the ground and you kind of are already in that situation and prevention really isn't an option, um, you can look to see if uh, erecting an owl box, either a barn owl box or a western screech owl box for gophers, I would recommend barn owls because they are larger with larger feet um so you you know you may have a higher success rate of those animals coming and predating animals in your area another thing potentially you can do which is a little more out of the box and really depends on comfort level is to make sure that 
you are setting up an environment that's good for snakes. Uh, snakes will go into the holes and eat. Um, gopher snakes are named gopher snakes because they do like to move into gopher holes. Um, and of course, when they live into gopher holes, who do you think they have to evict? And they evict animals by either scaring them away or by eating them. So that's another reason by using rodent poisons, we do not recommend. We didn't talk about snakes when we talked about rodent poisons earlier, but snakes would absolutely be impacted um, by rodenticides and it would kill that predator as well. So leaving areas to attract a snake where they can sun, so maybe a big flat rock that gets really warm during the day could be a great spot to attract them. Reserving a portion of your yard that is covered away from your house um, could also provide um, a space for a snake to live as well. I get a lot of calls from people who want their snakes removed. They've yeah. got a gopher snake and they're like, oh no, send your animal control out here, blah, blah, blah. And I tell them, oh, you're so lucky you have a gopher snake. Um, they're wonderful benign creatures. Sometimes people think they're rattlesnakes and that gets them into lots of trouble, but really they're great at getting rid of those rodents in your yard and they do nothing bad for you. So I always tell them, oh, you are so lucky. You want to be the snake backyard person. That's who you yeah. want to be. So if you can set yourself up for that success, you're golden. Yeah, Nicole, you tell them how lucky they are and that's when they hang up on you, right? <laughs> But I agree, having a, a gopher snake is great. And I would just like to say that it's hard to deal with gophers if you aren't willing to trap. Even if you are willing to trap, they're still difficult to trap and require a lot of work. Uh, people who are opposed to killing, um, you just need to try a lot of things. And the issue is with many of the things that work, is if the gophers tunnels are extensive, they can block them up to, you know, so they don't smell the kitty litter or they don't smell the urine. So um, you have to be relentless in um, evicting one. The good news is you usually don't have more than one depending on the size of your yard. They're solitary creatures. So um, let's go from gophers to uh, baby deer. I have a question about a baby deer keeps coming into our yard with uh, the mama by walking on the deck, but uh, the mama walks on the deck, but the babies have a hard time getting out, so they get stuck. Should we leave the tall backyard gates open to make it easier for them to come in and out, or better to close the deck gate so they don't hang out in the yard at all? Well, it sounds like they're getting in anyway, so I would suggest leaving that gate open so they can easily get back out. I, I would agree with Nicole, and the thing to remember with deer is, um, just in general, for those of you who maybe not know, uh, mom will leave baby deer behind, so when she is out moving around, so just because you see a deer on its own does not mean that it needs your help. If you're concerned about a deer or if you notice like an obvious injury where the animal is bleeding, then definitely call your local rehabilitator first uh, before removing them. But in this specific situation, leave the gate open. <laughs> Let them move on. And we like to tell people never to grab a fawn. Um, if they are absolutely sure there is a problem, Please call first. If there really is a problem, we can send somebody out to evaluate, but please don't just grab that fawn and bring it in. Yeah, when we do, that's actually a really common patient for us um, at Lindsay, and I'm sure Nicole probably similar for you, that is a very kidnap with intent to rescue situation. Um, it's, I think it's because they're cute and they're small and they make cute noises and they have the big deer eyes and they look like they need your help. They do not need to be abducted by you, the human alien. Um, and when we do the, the best thing and rehabilitating these animals is incredibly difficult. Um, they're very high stress, they're large, um, and they do not do that well in rehabilitation across the board. So our first thing that we always wanna do is try to return that baby to the mom. And we're very fortunate that we have dedicated volunteers who will return those animals. And sometimes they're returned in places that might not seem to make sense, like on the sides of highways, because that's where mom left them. And we will sit and we will watch and in many cases, uh, it does take hours sometimes, mom will return and move the baby away, even from weird spots. So definitely if you see, a, I think it's awesome that you are getting this really 
cool wildlife experience right in your backyard. I know personally, I'm jealous that you have a mom with her babies coming around in your yard. And I think it's really great that you're trying to set them up for success so that they can take care of themselves. Yeah, I think we can blame Disney for the uh, cute baby deer syndrome. Um, Oops, I just lost the question. Oh, we have two, Randall asked, we have two blue jays, I think probably scrub jays, that like to get hard pellet cat food from a bowl outside for a semi-feral cat. Is that hard cat food okay for the bird? I don't really recommend feeding cat food to birds for probably not great for the birds, but you're also gonna be attracting all other types of species. And maybe the species that you are gonna attract um, with cat food is probably gonna be things like crows and jays. Um, so I wouldn't, I wouldn't really use cat food for feeding birds. Yeah, I mean, here's the thing about feeding birds in general. I mean, feeding, um, well, first of all, feeding the feral cats and then having the jays eat it are setting the jays up to get killed by the cats. That, that's what's going to happen at some point, even if you don't see it. Um, Cause you're made, what's, it's unintentionally happening is the jays who are really, really smart, they're a corvid. So they're related to um, crows and ravens, um, which are some of the most intelligent animals on the planet. They will learn that, oh, this is a reliable food source and they'll come down and they'll get comfortable. Um, and if they get comfortable, then the cat nearby might take that as an opportunity to eat some, eat them instead of the kibble that you leave behind. So I definitely um, also wouldn't recommend it though. The, the act of a, a Corvid eating a piece of cat kibble does not, if not poisonous to them, it's more of the activity surrounding it. It's also not nutritionally formulated for Corvids. And uh, with some of our um, animals that are in permanent care at Lindsay Wildlife Experience with our Corvids, we will use that a little bit in their diet, but it isn't, it's used very, very sparsely. And again, it's not really so much the kibble, it's just the situation around it that's dangerous for the animal. Um, I've been waiting for a question about turkeys, and we've got one here. Um, the turkeys we have in an abundance are not native to this area. How do we discourage them from coming into our yard, and are they preyed upon by coyote? I saw a study not too long ago that the coyote's diet had changed from house cat primarily to primarily wild turkey. So I guess they're getting what they can. But anyway, what uh, y'all have any ideas on discouraging the turkey? Nicole, I think you're about to say. What's that? I, th I thought you were about to say something. No. Turkeys love turkeys. They're little, they're tiny dinosaurs walking around your backyard. But like you mentioned, they are not native. They were introduced here um, in order for hunting and they do still remain here. Um, discouraging them from your backyard. Here's the thing, if you get a turkey, you know you're not just getting one. You're about to get a whole bunch of turkeys in there. So when do the turkeys come in? So discouraging from coming in, turkeys eat a wide variety of things. They're gonna be eating plant material. They're gonna be eating insects. So it's pretty hard to completely eliminate what attracts a turkey into your area, other than the things that we've already mentioned. Of course, if you're reducing the amount of places for um, other animals to hide, potentially it can reduce the turkeys from coming in. Realistically, you're probably gonna to have to be more on the defensive rather than the offensive. So when, I, when you have turkeys come into your area, you're gonna to have to be that proactive um, person. Go out there and act like a cartoon character. Grab a pot and a pan, make a bunch of noise, flash your, these are diurnal animals. They are gonna be coming around during the day. So white in itself is not bothersome, but you making a bunch of noise, spraying your hose, um, not even directly at them, just kind of acting like a nut um, will be effective. They were like, Ugh, I don't want to come into this yard. Whenever we do, it is not peaceful. It's not an easy place for me to be. Um, and they'll, they'll tend to want to move on from there. But one of the things I've noticed that are keep turkeys around are people feeding them. So if you do have any, either purposely or accidentally, I know I see that in my area all the time where people are actively feeding these animals and they're going to continue to come into that space. So if you do feed birds or uh, with bird feeders and you notice turkeys are coming into your area, I would just take the feeders down for a while until the turkeys move on. And then again, go out there and act, act wild 
and try to just be like, Ugh, this is not a place that I want to hang out. Yeah, air horns are good for that too. And um, <clears throat> I, I've had people recommend like taking an umbrella and opening it and closing it rapidly in the direction of the turkeys. Turkeys have this reputation of being really stupid, but they aren't. And they catch on quicker than other animals that they aren't wanted in that yard. And so usually if you scare them off once or twice, you don't have a problem um, again. And I don't know if we have time for one more question. Um, I like this one from Jane. She loves her wildlife. She has deer, birds, acorn woodpeckers and doves, raccoons, skunks, coyotes. Um, and she thinks what might be a small bobcat um, that all visit her yard and she's not feeding them, but is there anything that she should be aware of? She has two indoor cats, so they are safe, but I did have a neighbor who has an indoor cat that was sitting on top of the sofa by a window and the coyote jumped at the window. Um, so is it okay to just, you know, be an observer and maybe keep your pets inside when the animals are roaming? I think that's the best thing she can do. She can enjoy that wildlife around her, but be safe, keep your small animals indoors, um, cats especially, um, and cats can get themselves into trouble by being aggressive with, with wildlife. So I think she's doing all the right things. Again, another yard I'm very jealous of. Yeah, we're doing, we're doing all the right things here. Um, that signals to me that that environment that is created in the backyard and the adjacent areas is really robust and healthy. You like to see a situation where you're seeing basically the entire ecosystem around. You're seeing prey items, you're seeing predators. Um, that lets us know that that environment near there is healthy and those animals are being left to do what they are meant to do in the wild. So definitely keep your pets inside. And yeah, I mean, that was probably pretty scary when the coyote jumped at the window. Um, and that is why we keep our cats inside. Yeah. <laughs> okay, I lied. I'm going to take one more uh, question just because I have a good answer for it. And it's one of those that it's like, it's so simple. Whoever would have thought, but uh, someone asked about crows mobbing bird feeders. And is there a humane way to discourage them? A lot of the things that discourage crows would also discourage other birds. But there's one thing specific to crows that when I first heard this, I didn't really believe it, but I've had tons of people do it and it's successful. You take a stuffed fake dead crow, obviously it's dead, <clears throat> and you go out at night when the birds, when the crows aren't going to see you, and you hang it in a prominent place upside down or you can just lay it out on the lawn. The crows will kind of like have a little funeral ceremony for it in the morning and then they go away and they won't come back for a long time. If they see you putting out the crow, they're, they're on to you and they won't be, um, it won't work, but doing it in the dead of night apparently works wonders and scares crows away. I love that. So easy. I'm going to use that. The next time I get that call, that's what I'm going to say. <laughs> I learned something today, everybody. And here's, here's the reason why that works <laughs> is, um, and the fact that you said, I, there's a really important note there that Joe mentioned is don't let them see you do it because cor corvids, again, some of the most intelligent animals on the planet, and they have done studies where basically a human wore a mask so it was a consistent every single time. And they would feed that animal at first. And the animal was like, oh, sweet. Whenever I see the mask, they'd come down. They're like, that's awesome. And then the another mask was born and they were holding exactly what I was right, a dead crow. And those crows went wild. Crows are an incredibly social species that absolutely they do perform um, funeral uh, behaviors as part of their independent crow culture, which is very interesting and beautiful, in my opinion. Um, it shows the complexity of nature that sometimes we're not fully aware of or into. Um, but then the mask would come back without the crow and the crows would dive bomb that mask. It didn't matter if the mask was upside down. It didn't matter if it was like years later. In fact, they studied that, they figured out that even crows who never saw the original person, the original mask, 
place the dead crow down, we're still reacting to the mask, which indicates that there might be some cultural learning um, from the other members of the group saying, no, 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 trust me, that one's a bad guy. So what you don't want to happen in that situation is then the crows think you're the bad guy. Um, I have heard where someone has done a similar technique or they removed a dead crow or they touched the dead and the other crow saw and the crow then would go over their car and poop all over their car or come and mob them when they came out. And that's not your intention. With what Joan was setting up is you're trying to tell the other crows that this space is dangerous and don't come back here. And you're not trying to say I'm dangerous because they have all of their friends and they have greater numbers than you. And they may choose to leave because they don't want to deal with your aggressiveness and killing their dead. Or alternatively, they might think that it is their mission to seek vengeance against the dead. So do it in the dark. Great suggestion. <laughs> So along those lines, we had a recent case where somebody called, they had an orphaned um, crow and we, we were trying to work with them, get them to leave it out. You know, the parents are definitely around, it's a healthy bird, blah, blah, blah. No, 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 there's no parents, there's no crows. They bring it to us, they're like, we're not putting it back out. I'm like, okay, fine. So we're raising this crow. And it's probably maybe four or five days later, they call me, can we please have the baby back? The parents will not stop attacking us. And so we did get the baby back, it finished, but the parents knew and they knew which one of the homeowners had grabbed that baby and took it in. And every time that person went outside, boom, they were attacked. So they do recognize faces and they do remember and they are a little bit vengeful or a lot. <laughs> yeah, they don't forgive or forget. Exactly. Oh, I love them. <laughs> <laughs> oh, great. Well, we are unfortunately out of time. Um, I know we didn't get anywhere close to answering all the questions, but I hope uh, we covered some stuff and that you were uh, you found as fascinating as I did. I, I really had a, a good time. So thank you very much, Emma and Nicole, for joining us today. And <clears throat> I'm going to turn it back over to Aaron. Hi everyone, thank you. And thank you ladies for a great conversation. Um, again, we didn't get to all the questions, um, but we will have Joan go through them as she normally does and try to answer them and create uh, an article that you guys will see uh, online and uh, hopefully in the print as well. So be on the lookout in the next, I don't know, couple of days, week or so to see uh, those questions answered. Um, just wanted to give a little bit of shout out to our panelists. Um, so Emma, again, is from the Lindsay Wildlife Experience. So if you are looking to get involved, want to donate, um, just check it out. Uh, please do so. We would uh, love for all of our, our listeners to participate. Um, and the donation uh, link is right on the bottom at the lindsaywildlife.org slash, slash reimagine. Uh, and then, of course, for Miss Nicole, as we go to our next slide, if you have any uh, interest in checking her organization out, uh, the Peninsula Humane Society and SPCA, please do so. There are a few links there. Uh, if you're interested uh, in donating, of course, please see the link at the bottom, the phs-spca.org slash donate, and then some other links to uh, help for the sick and injured, uh, and then just for adoption as well. So again, please check those different opportunities out. We'd love for you guys to participate. Uh, and then at last, our upcoming events. Uh, so if you are looking for more of our flora and fauna events, we will be doing a gardening, what went wrong, right? No one has ever said that before in the history of gardening. Um, so check it out on July 15th. I, I know it will be filled with a ton of questions, a ton of answers. Uh, so we don't wanna miss that. And then also later in the summer, we're going to be doing a wildfire gardening. Uh, as we know, drought is here uh, and summer is starting and not a great combination. So what can we do, you know, in our gardens, uh, in our yards to help uh, deter wildfire? Uh, some other topics that are coming up a little bit sooner, though, uh, we have our June 18th bookish event. That is our partnership with our Southern California papers. Um, so we don't have a topic for that one yet. Uh, but it will be coming soon, so make sure to check that out. And then on June 24th, we have our drawing episode two, uh, drawing wildlife in your own backyard. We, we kind of continue that theme of wildlife for a few weeks, uh, and we will have Kate from uh, Las Casitas College here out in Livermore 
be doing our drawing uh, episode number two. So please check that out. We'd love for you to join. Uh, and you can register at mercurynews.com slash events, eastbaytimes.com slash events, and marinij.com slash events. If you guys have any other uh, topics that you would like to have us look at, um, gardening, animal, or just any in general, we'd love to hear from you. Please uh, email us at vevents at bayarianewsgroup.com. And that's it for us today. So thank you guys again. Thank you, Emma, Nicole, Joan. Uh, we hope everyone has a wonderful Thursday morning and uh, have a great Memorial Day weekend, guys.